started. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first uh, joint grand rounds between the Department of Global, Global Health and the Department of Surgery. Uh, we're very excited to, to have Dr. Pardikar join us for this, uh, for this first joint grand rounds. Um, I'll uh, let Dr. Jason Best uh, start with a few words and I'll introduce Dr. Pardikar and then we'll uh, hear, his, hear his talk. Thanks, Dr. Stewart. Yeah, so as Dr. Stewart mentioned, my name is um, Jason Vesti, and I'm an infectious disease physician in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Disease and in the Department of Global Health. And on behalf of the Department of Global Health, I'd like to welcome you to a very, very special Grand Rounds today, as this actually marks our first joint Global Health Grand Rounds co-hosted by the Departments of Surgery and by the Department of Global Health. And we're thrilled to have Dr. Tom Podakar for our inaugural speaker. We look forward to continuing um, these joint grand rounds in the future to bring light, and interest, advocacy, and action to improve access to the high quality and equitable surgical services around the world. Dr. Stewart, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Jason. Uh, so Dr. Podakar is a professor of global burn injury at the Center for um, Global Burn Injury Policy and Research at Swansea University. A uh, recent past consultant to plastic and reconstructive surgeon at the Welsh Center for Burns and Plastic Surgery. Uh, he's the current chief surgeon uh, of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Dr. Podikar has been engaged with humanitarian surgical care since the 1980s. Uh, and this has included uh, direct care delivery, capacity building, program evaluation, and leadership for several organizations during most of the major crises of our lifetimes uh, and in more than 60 countries. He's been a long uh, uh, and devoted surgeon advocate for people with burn injury specifically. Uh, in 2006, Dr. Podikar founded and has since directed the most uh, impactful global burn injury prevention and control organization uh, named Interburns. He has consulted extensively with the World Health Organization. He's worked with our own Dr. Charlie Mock to generate landmark WHO guidance on injury and burn prevention and care. He supported the developments and implementation of the Global Burn Registry based at the WHO. Uh, and he recently hosted the first meeting uh, of the WHO Emergency Medical Team's Technical Working Group uh, on Burns. I had the honor of first meeting Dr. Podikar at the World Health Assembly in 2015. Uh, what inspired me most uh, about our conversation was his provocation to improve burn care, not only by building capacity globally, but also by unlocking human uh, potential and capabilities. I was uh, and continue to be grateful for his experience and wisdom and dedication, uh, including to some of our trainees like Dr. Kajal Mehta. Uh, Dr. Podikar became the chief surgeon uh, of the ICRC last year. Uh, 163 years before his appointment, Henri Durand, a Swiss businessman, was traveling through present-day northern Italy immediately after the Battle of Solferino uh, between the French forces under Napoleon III and the Austrian forces under Emperor Franz Joseph I. This was the last battle in history where the armies uh, were under the personal com uh, command of their monarchs. The combatants totaled nearly 300,000 uh, people, and Durant arrived uh, just uh, in time to witness the unimaginable suffering of tens of thousands of men lying shot and bayoneted, awaiting their deaths in the absence of battlefield care. In his memoir entitled A Memory of Solferino, Durant posed, would it not be possible in a time of peace and quiet to form relief societies for the purpose of having care given to the wounded in wartime by zealous, devoted, and thoroughly qualified volunteers? Durant's advocacy and direction led to the uh, International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement and the Geneva Conventions, and the four fundamental principles of humanitarian action, including humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. Durant later won the first Nobel Peace Prize for his vision. ICRC, which is the exemplar of humanitarian surgical care, is now planned and organized by Dr. Podikar, a zealous, devoted, and thoroughly qualified humanitarian surgeon and health system engineer. Welcome, Dr. Podikar. It's a true honor to have you with us this morning, particularly given all the global crises, and thank you for your precious time with us. Thank you very much, Barclay, and uh, thank you to, to all those uh, who are, uh, have joined up on this, uh, this webinar. I'm uh, very grateful to you to uh, what seems to me quite early in the morning, half past six. Uh, it's half past three over here, as I've said, so a little bit more sociable. Um, and uh, thank you very much for those, uh, those uh, uh, comments, and it's a great uh, honour for me uh, to be the 
talk, uh, the talk at this first joint surgical and, uh, and global health uh, inaugural meeting that you're having. And I, and I hope one day when things get a little bit uh, easier, I'll be able to actually come over and uh, visit because it's something that's uh, been meaning to do for some time and uh, just not yet got round to it due to COVID, etc. So I shall um, share my screen if that's OK and uh, start the presentation. So just before I start, if I could just check, uh, somebody just say they could see the screen okay? Yes. Perfect, okay. Thank you very much. So, and, and please, if there's any issues, just uh, interject if, if uh, suddenly you can't see the screen or anything. So I'm going to really uh, take you on a bit of a journey uh, around contemporary issues in humanitarian surgical care, um, and really try and, and sort of challenge you, to be honest, to, to to perhaps think differently about some things, um, but also to, to then give some examples of some of the areas of humanitarian, humanitarian surgical care and global surgery that I've been involved in over, over the last uh, couple of decades or so. So uh, to start with really very, very briefly, just looking at the definitions or what exactly we mean. Then I want to focus a little bit on the, some of the current challenges that we face. Uh, then give uh, four examples of, of, of very different uh, scenarios, but uh, all of which I've been involved in over the years, which I think cover some of those challenges and, and the ways that uh, we've adapted to them. Perhaps briefly then finish by mentioning what the future holds. So global surgery or humanitarian surgery to start with, these are terms that we often hear interchangeably, uh, what exactly do they mean um, and, and what do people understand by them? So often I think we, we sort of, these are all papers uh, that I've been involved with academic publications over the last few years. You know, is this what we mean? This sort of, you know, these um, academic articles that are uh, uh, and research or is it more than that? Well, I think it certainly does include academic work and I think that's an important part of, of of both global and humanitarian surgery, but of course it's also the clinical work, the at the coal face, if you like, um, and the humanitarian side goes beyond the clinical work, of course. And what's the aim of it? Because I think it's very important if we talk about this. Well, what what actually is the purpose? So when we're thinking of surgery, for me, it's around reducing the incidence of either disease or trauma, reducing the complications, and improving the outcomes. And how can we achieve that? Is it just through, through those three factors, academic, clinical, and humanitarian work? Well, I think we need to do a lot of other things that perhaps don't fit into those specific boxes. And there, that includes breaking down barriers, supporting colleagues, sharing experiences, fighting injustice, fighting inequality, and building a better world. And I think that all that together makes up what we consider to be global or humanitarian surgery and as far as the difference is concerned for me I, I, I see it as, as a bit like from the bench to the bedside that global surgery tends to focus more if you like on the academic side um, and research etc but still obviously has a clinical element but is more that the bench part whereas humanitarian surgery is more the, the end delivery so it focuses more on the clinical side rather than the academic and clearly we need both of those working together if we want to improve surgical outcomes across the globe. So the traditional view, um, these images, interestingly, this is, this is when, when I typed in humanitarian surgery into Google images, these are the first three images that came up. So as you can see, they're very much, you know, operating theater, staff from high income countries, working in a poor country, Often it's charitable work and people think of emergency and disaster scenarios. So that's the sort of traditional view, if you like, we have around humanitarian surgical work. But there are some modern concepts that uh, um, have, have started to perhaps address some of these views and, and look to the future. One of these is, is something that uh, I'm quite interested in and I've done some work on in the past is is around what is now called asset-based development. And, and this is it's just shifting the focus, but moving away from constantly thinking of the needs and the gap in needs is to, is to look at the assets as well. And 
this is very similar to providing, for example, feedback uh, in, in education, where we always start with what was the positive before moving on to what was not so good. And I think we, we need to look more at that and look at, first of all, OK, what what are the assets? What What's going well? What is good in a place? What have they got? Rather than immediately jumping to the needs side. So I think that's one important uh, uh, change. There is a concept called resilience humanitarianism, which which focuses much more on building capacity and resilience within countries rather than uh, providing external care, if you like, to 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 try and support programs. So this is very much around looking to build more sustainable approaches that that rely less and less than on external support because you're you're building the the, the capacity within country. Uh, the systems approach, so moving perhaps away from very focused, but looking at a whole system and that understanding that if you want to change outcomes and improve outcomes uh, in surgical care, then what happens in the operating theatre is one small part of a, a very complex integrated system that starts with, with you know, where the injury takes place and can involve transport, access, you know, pharmaceutical companies, politicians, uh, um, energy companies, everything in the hospital from the cleaning to the anesthesia to the surgery, um, family. So it's a much more complicated system. And whenever you make a change to one part of the system, it has an impact on the other part of the system. So I think that's, that's something that uh, has increasingly had an impact. And perhaps what hasn't so much is is what I would call defeating medical imperialism. And there is still, you know, there's still remnants of, of the sort of 19th century approach, uh, the, the kind of charitable approach towards uh, uh, um, medical humanitarian work, where it's considered very much as as uh, the, the richer countries helping out the poorer countries, but in a slightly um, in an in a not a very equitable manner, and and also of course has been used um, for other purposes as well such as gaining influence etc particularly politically so you know we, we that's a reality that also needs to be considered whether that's that is a, a modern concept that has yet been taken fully on board i'm not entirely sure but i think there are signs that we are moving away from that slightly dated uh, approach so what are the, the challenges? The, I mean, these are by no means comprehensive, but these are, I think, some, some key challenges across the board in terms of human resources, funding, access, education and training, research and impact evaluation. So I'd just like to address each of these briefly, and, and obviously any of them could be a, you know, a topic in itself um, that we could go into at great length, but I just want to highlight some of the key points from each of these. So in terms of human resources, sorry, there's quite a lot of text on the right, but uh, I just wanted to, to emphasize this bit. So, and this was written um, about armed conflict, but it applies really to any form of, of humanitarian surgery, that the delivery of high quality surgical care to victims goes beyond the ability to perform a laparotomy or debride a wound. Putting knife to skin under pressure, perhaps in an insecure environment with resources running low and limited chance of referring patients onwards demands specific knowledge, particular skill set and certain personal characteristics. It also represents the tip of a pyramid and the final stage in a process of decision making influenced by sound clinical principles, astute situational awareness and assessment resting on a foundation of humanitarianism, impartiality, neutrality and independence. And I must admit, in my years of working in the humanitarian field um, if you ask me what is the most significant um, driver if you like for change and for improvement it's what I've put at the bottom of that pyramid it's commitment motivation honesty and, and respect of those people working not just in the health field but in in any field that contributes to to improving health outcomes and then of course people must have the the knowledge and skills um, that are appropriate and then they must be in a position to be able to make decisions to have an impact but i think there's there's been a tendency in the past perhaps to focus too much uh, and still is in fact to focus a little bit too much on the middle part there on the knowledge and skills and 
we constantly hear about training and I'll come on to education and training, but around training programs and about teaching and what we can give and teach and train. Um, and I think sometimes we overemphasize the technical skills and knowledge and perhaps underemphasize these other things, which a combination of, a, say, human factors and behavioral um, issues, which actually have a very, very significant impact on, on whether things happen or not. Um, so funding, this is a this is another issue. Um, and there's often a, 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 a tug of war, if you like, um, between two opposing elements for this. One is what the needs are and one are where the money comes from in terms of grants, donations and bursaries. So I've worked as a professor in the university for for some years. I, I'm no longer there, but um, the the grants, the system is very much oh, based around what is there available in terms of funding and grants and then what can we do that will line up with that grant and give us a better opportunity and actually that's the wrong way around we, we should be having the needs first and what we need to do and then the money should follow that rather than looking to, to try and fulfill the demands of what the grants and the donations and the bursaries are um, because these are all influenced by many things these are influenced by by politics particularly if they're granted so you know some of the biggest donors are government donors they're influenced by the sort of the, the trends and the fashions if you like um and even or i'm not talking about um you know fashion in in terms of uh, trends of uh, what people look like and stuff i mean in terms of fashion in terms of what what is top of the list at the moment you know and it goes it changes from clearly at the moment you know there's been a huge uh, um, uh, investment in, in COVID for example you have uh, issues related to gender that can become very much the top of the pile for a period of time and then you know um, they get replaced by something else um, and there's things that often are left very much at the bottom and Burns would of course be a good example of that which often is neither fashionable nor trendy. The media have an influence um, because um, and increasingly, of course, because of social media as well, but what actually gets put out and um, sometimes that is not necessarily, as we all know, what, what we see in the media is not always a, a very true reflection of reality. Corporate policy. So when when uh, donors are very, very wealthy companies and corporations, etc., well, then clearly they have their their policies and we've seen recently with um with the the buyout of twitter for example how you know individuals now very few number of individuals around the world control a huge amount of the media and clearly you know their ideas then will influence their policies geography you know a lot of a lot of uh, donations and grants are linked to geographical regions for one reason or another and often it's the loudest voice and the loudest voice is not necessarily just as we know in the mass casualty situation is not necessarily the person with the biggest problem and that's the same in healthcare in general and applicant bias and what i mean by that is um you know those that have worked in the system a long time understand the the game to an extent in terms of applying for grants and bursaries and know how to make their way around them so therefore they are more likely to be successful in getting funding and of course, influence. Um, you know, the 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 people are. You know, there's uh, there's those that have uh, the right connections with the right people or the right organisations and are able to influence um, where monies go. But it's not just uh, the the sort of battle between the needs and and the the financing. There's also between what are the actual needs and what are the perceived needs. Um, and these are not necessarily the same. And when we talk about the needs, do we mean the needs of the individual or the population or parts thereof? Because they can be very different. Do we take an approach of the most good for the most people, um, a sort of utilitarian type approach? How do we define suffering? Um, you know, if we say humanitarianism is around reducing suffering, uh, you know, it's very difficult to 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 equate different levels of suffering and, and say, well, this is more than that, or this one deserves more than the other. So it's difficult to actually define that. And do we focus more on the quality of life or on the quantity of life? So all these will impact on whether we're looking at and what people consider to be 
the actual needs or what perhaps they perceive to be uh, the needs. Access, uh, access has always been an issue. And I think if anything, it's probably getting worse. And I would suggest, you know, are we really getting to where the needs are the greatest? And if you think of these countries over the last, uh, you know, decade or so, are we really in these countries getting to where the needs are actually at their highest? So, um, you know, there was a lot of difficulties in in uh, in Syria, for example, accessing patients, and even now in Ukraine, for example, um, you know, we've seen with uh, areas under siege such as Mariupol. That's the area where the needs are going to be the highest, but you know, at the moment, it's just not possible to get in there. So, often then. The, the, the funding and the resources get diverted to where the needs are perhaps not the highest. Education and training, um, just like, like uh, access to healthcare, I think it's important to, to look at this in terms of equality and equity, et cetera. You know, should we provide education and training the same for everyone? Well, no, because clearly people's needs are different. So um, we need to be very careful about how we deliver training. Um, the reality is, is often the case that those actually get the most training and perhaps not necessarily those that, that uh, always have the highest needs. Um, and this is the same across the board. It's the same with research as well. And we see this 90-10 divide where, where most of the most of the resources are spent um, in, in parts of the world where, where the needs are actually the, the least. Equitable distribution. Um, I think we do need to look at equitable distribution in terms of education and training, and 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 balance what we do, and make sure that any programs are adjusted to to fit what is required and to fill those gaps. Right, and so therefore, there, there's a lot uh, that needs to be done with education and training to make sure it is appropriate, relevant, etc. And of course, liberation or justice is when you remove those barriers. Um, just as we remove them ideally in healthcare, but also in terms of education and, and training as well. So everybody has equal access. So who needs to be taught? What do they need to be taught? Where do they need to be taught? And how do they need to be taught? Or in fact, I'd perhaps prefer to, to, to base it the other way around and say, who needs to learn? What do they need to to, to learn, where do they need to learn, and how do they need to learn. So in terms of who needs to learn, when we're looking at trying to improve healthcare in some of the, the most difficult regions of the world, I think it's anyone who can influence outcomes. So we need to be broader rather than thinking necessarily that it's, it's just the surgeon or it's just the nurse or it's just the doctor. And that's where this systems approach, um, I think, is very helpful. What do they need to learn? Well, this brings me back to the, the, the pyramid I, I spoke earlier around the sort of human factors, the knowledge and skills and decision making, etc. And I say I think we tend to overemphasize this middle bit, and most training focuses on this part. And, and I think actually we need to, to look more at this human behavior side of things because at the end of the day, change comes with change in human behavior. The knowledge itself doesn't intrinsically lead to any change unless there's a change of behavior attached to it. Where do they need to learn, home or away? I mean, I think there's advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, through my, my uh, work with Interburns, we have set up training centers. Uh, we have two in Nepal, one in India and one in South Africa, because I believe, and as an organization, we believe to, to educate people and train them in the appropriate management of burn care in the environments that they work in, it's best to get that training in the types of environment they work in rather than bring them to an extremely high-tech environment where um, it's, it's, uh, it's just not realistic and the level of care that is delivered in terms, principally in terms of cost, are just not reproducible. Um, so I think it's better to establish centers of excellence within uh, the, 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 the countries that uh, we're actually trying to support. And how? Well, I think it's really important to use innovative, innovative participatory hands-on methodology. And if you want people to really change their behavior, then it's really important that the education and training focuses on that um, and it's not just seen as a, a kind of didactic knowledge giving process but that it has to be very very 
participatory and uh, innovative in the way that uh, it is delivered. So in terms of educational resources, they need to follow pedagogical principles without getting bogged down in, in academia. They need to be relevant, appropriate and contextual. And that sounds very simple, but it's often forgotten. Um, and we see very frequently, you know, the majority of educational programs are developed in high income countries for high income countries and then often just tweaked a bit um, and then re-churned out for, for the less resourced environment. And uh, again, I'll demonstrate an example in a minute, but through Interburns, you know, all our training materials, all our educational programs are designed from scratch using a process of divergent, convergent thinking, using a team that are brought together from across the, the spectrum, but mostly from the low resource environment and from Africa, Asia, the Middle East, the countries we work in, to make sure that everything that we do in terms of this material is relevant, appropriate and contextualized. And the goals need to be achievable. There's no point in, in setting a, a barrier that is so high that uh, they're not just going to be achievable because then you're setting up people to fail. Um, so need to be realistic and achievable goals. And um, this is very difficult when we talk about one, you know, one, uh, one standard for the whole world, because clearly um, that's not possible in many, many areas. But then it also depends very much on how that standard is defined. Um, so if we get down into too much detail, that's when it becomes unachievable. But if you set the standard as, as um, uh, for example, I don't know, that, you know, ideally all full thickness burns uh, should be excised within a certain time period. You know, that's something that people can aim to and possibly achieve. If you set the standard as that all burn patients need to be seen by uh, you know, a mental health team within 24 hours, have a rehabilitation prescription written immediately, have access to, to uh, um, donor skin, to um, artificial templates, etc. Well, those things clearly are not going to be achievable. So it's important that the standards are, that the standards are of a level that is appropriate um, while still um, enabling improvement. And the focus should be on knowledge to action rather than just knowledge. So knowledge to action is a, is, is a really important part. And I think any educational resource should be designed to inspire and motivate people uh, as much as to just give them knowledge. So here, just some examples. So this is in terms of the pedagogical approach, as I was talking about, here's a uh, lesson plan that uh, we've developed, for example, at ICRC for the Fundamentals of War Surgery training program. So you can see here, you know, this is a clinical components on blast injury. It says very much, you know, this is the intended learning outcomes. This is, these are the topics. This is the method of teaching, what the purpose of the session is, the sequence, what materials and equipment are required, what supporting documents, and then more detail on the actual um, uh, activities and exactly what they involve. And so this enables that a course such as this then to be much easier to teach a faculty to deliver it. it the course itself is standardized the outcomes are standardized and everyone understands what's what is going on and what the pu purpose is and as i said neighbors you look at it and see okay have we got enough different approaches here oh in here you can see there's an interactive animated tool there's there's podcasts there's all sorts of things to move away from the the more traditional one person giving us uh, uh, you know a, 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 a number of slide presentations one after the other and then this is an example of a, a document so this is the interburns essential burn care manual say designed entirely from scratch going along with the essential burn care course which itself was uh, everything here all the pictures are taken from africa asia the middle east from a low resource environment um, so it's very much based on what is available and achievable and it's even color coded to uh, include uh, in, at the end of each chapter, the knowledge that is needed and the action that is needed. So a sort of more um, modern approach, if you like, to some of the pedagogy. And then this would be another example. This was something we produced from the Center for Global Burn Injury at, at Swansea University in, in uh, collaboration with Interburns. Yeah, this is a practical guide to quality improvement for burn care in low resource settings. And again, this was based on a program we ran for nurses uh, coming from Malawi and Ethiopia. 
um, and they were involved in doing quality, being taught about quality improvement and implementation science and had to actually produce a quality improvement project over the course of the program they did. And then we used those uh, to illustrate this manual on uh, specifically looking at quality improvement based on case studies from uh, Malawi and Ethiopia and real life situations. Then uh, research. Um, so what about the challenges of research. Well, this was a paper that I wrote quite a few years back now. Um, look, it was a global overview of Burns research, highlighting the need for forming networks within the developing world. And there's actually a survey going around at the moment uh, from some uh, from Bristol University, I think, to to try and uh, evaluate what the global burn research priorities are and as i say we did this process uh, i think this was i can't remember 2007 perhaps um looking at burns research and it highlighted that 90 percent of the research is done in high income countries despite the fact that 90 percent of the injuries are in low income countries and this statement from the World Health Organization, which I use a lot because I think it really uh, is important, says that affordable, effective interventions exist to reduce morbidity and mortality, but there's little understanding of how best to deliver these across the full range of existing health systems and wide diversity of possible settings. So what that means is, as we know in burn care, we know how to treat burns, we know how to get good results, and we know how to prevent burns with respect to burn injury, for example, but, um, that's mostly based on, on work and evidence in, in high income countries where we've had great success and we're not able currently to translate that to similar success in the low income environment. Um, so we have this, this, uh, this, this constant 90-10 divide. So I think the research uh, uh, in terms of priorities, we, we should, and what my research interest was, was in implementation and improvement research. Um, so moving away from the kind of classic research and control trials and this, that and the other, and the sort of proof of, of uh, effectiveness to looking at these more uh, hybrid effectiveness implementation studies in the real world environment and looking at how we can actually take what we know works and uh, implement that into the real world environment. And I think that's really where the focus of research should be, rather than perhaps looking um, at, uh, you know, more and more technological and scientific uh, advances. And then of course, there's these areas that are what I, what I would define as under-researched, but over-influential. One of these is corruption, you know, in all the services I've been in, in many, many countries around the world, I'd say one of the biggest contributory factors is corruption, yet you see very little published um, or written about corruption. Communication, again, this is a real issue in many places and, and is responsible for an awful lot of, of uh, problems and poor outcomes. Human factors, uh, which we know have a massive influence, um, but again, there's very little research. To, I mean, fortunately, this is now changing, but uh, there hasn't been, uh, I think, what called the economics of poverty, and that's a, a misunderstanding by, by higher income countries about what what it really means to be poor um you know when you don't know where your next meal is coming from where you haven't got enough money to support your children etc and unless you've actually experienced that it's very difficult to understand then some of the choices and decisions that people make um, and there are some groups now and organizations doing really really good work on understanding what i would call the economics of poverty and the, the sort of concept that the West is the best and that we have all the answers and actually does that have in certain scenarios a negative influence on what uh, on in trying to improve healthcare. Um, and and it is there's always this inequality between the the more powerful influential richer countries that also tend to be those that provide a lot of the humanitarian global surgery assistance. Um, but understandably, um, it's, it's then based on our approach, our attitudes, our philosophy to an extent in Western countries. And I think we need to look a little bit more at that. And that's why it's so important to engage with and try and make the relationship and those we work with a much more equitable relationship, but a much more equal in the sense that equal partnerships rather than, than um, uh, this, this more sort of... Um, parochial uh sorry a more sort of um yeah uh, approach where there's one, one side that is rather has rather more influence and power than the other 
the digital, uh, I don't want to get into digital particularly, but just to perhaps mention that, you know, this, it, it, it comes up so often and everywhere you now see, you know, digital transformation, this, that and the other. And yes, I think digital has huge potential, but, and it is a big but, it is by no means the answer to everything. And I think sometimes, we, again, we over-focus on, on, because we have the technology digitally to do so many things now, that that's the solution to everything. Um, and it's not um, for a whole host of reasons, which I say, uh, again, another lecture in itself, but I think digital has its place absolutely, but it should not be considered as the, the, the answer to everything. And then impact evaluation, you know, I think we often just look at capacity, um, you know, does, does a facility have the capacity to do something, but that doesn't really tell us whether they're doing something, the delivery, and even that doesn't then tell us what the outcomes are. So we need to look at all three of those. And that's what the comprehensive integrated approach that Interburns has taken, which I'll mention briefly. We're not very good at defining good versus bad outcomes and outcomes research and outcomes evaluation is, is a really um, an area within global health and, and humanitarian surgery that I think really needs a lot of, lot of work to, to try and be able to define some reproducible outcome measures. The impact evaluation is often based more on the donor demand, so what the donor wants to know about rather than necessarily what, what is actually having a true impact. And the time frame for change, particularly with, with uh, you know, global surgery and healthcare can often be a very, very long time and go way beyond the time period of a grant. So it is difficult to, it is difficult to demonstrate impact sometimes. Um, and bad can be good. And what I mean by that, for example, is just a, a simple example would be something like a burn service. If you, it depends what you're measuring. So if you measure mortality, you may find your mortality goes up in a burn service with the, the, the understanding being then, well, it must be getting worse, but actually it could be getting better. And the reason that the mortality is on up is because the service is so much better that people are sending patients with much, much more severe injury and therefore their mortality has gone up. So, you know, it, the, the impact evaluation needs to be very thoughtful and, and, and uh, it needs careful analysis. And do we, do we look at quantitative data or qualitative data? Uh, it's easy to look at facts and figures, but that's not necessarily always gonna give us the best answer. So I think in terms of what we can do for that, uh, think of the end before beginning. So think of what sort of uh, things can be measured and monitored throughout the process of any intervention and at the end of it before even starting. Collect as you go, because it's much easier than, than trying to, to look back afterwards. Broaden the definitions in terms of impact um, to try and widen them as, as much as possible. Uh, if it's related to, to donors, for example, then, then it's better to challenge them about measuring impact before rather than afterwards when they will be less, uh, uh, perhaps less interested in hearing your, what they will see as excuses. Um, and it's important to, get, to gather stories as well as statistics because that human touch uh, is, is, is often very, very impactful. It's not just numbers on a page. So now uh, I'd just like to, I'm going to go through this really quite quickly because I know it's already uh, uh, 10 past. So um, I just want to go through these examples of, this is really now just putting some of that into context, but also just giving some examples that I've been involved with that, that helps as well, I think, demonstrate the breadth of, of humanitarian surgery and what it means. So I'm going to start with reconstructive war surgery. So war surgery was traditionally seen as saving life and saving limb. Um, and one of the things I'm trying to do now here at ICRC is to, to move away from this slightly more traditional approach and to look more at improving function and form as well, which for want of a better word, I would call reconstructive war surgery, which then takes all these things into account. So what does that actually mean in reality? It means taking this sort of wound. So this is a high velocity gunshot wound to a lower limb. And, you know, we need to look at saving the life of the patient and the limb, but also then the function and the form. So moving beyond those initial processes to looking at the, what we can do to better improve function and form. And ideally to end up with, with, you know, this, this is relatively soon afterwards, the same patient. Yes, he's still limping, but he's got a healed wound, progressing, uh, no osteomyelitis, um, and hopefully will make a, a, a relatively 
uh, strong recovery. So in this case, we're talking about repair what can be repaired, reconstruct what needs reconstruction, rehabilitate and reintegrate back into society. Um, so that's what I'm talking about when we talk about reconstructive war surgery and, and looking at this holistic biopsychosocial outcome. So not just at the physical side, but the psychological, the social, the economic and, and particularly in terms of children, the educational side as well. So here, just to give an example of that, these are all cases from uh, uh, from the last couple of years, um, looking at, at how reconstructive surgery can play a role in improving the form and the function. So these cases with significant soft tissue loss um, and chronic uh, and, and acute osteomyelitis, so gentamicin beads being placed in there, uh, fascia cutaneous flap, the skin graft. This is a, a sort of after uh, at the end of the procedure. Another example, we're using a more old fashioned style, but in a low resource environment, very effective with a big defect of the ankle there using a flap from the opposite leg, uh, what's called a cross leg flap, um, which requires the patient having their legs uh, bound together for a, a, a two to three weeks. And then this sort of result at the end. So, you know, you, you, this is something that in times past would have ended up with an amputation. Muscle flaps, again, uh, filling holes and defects. You can see a, a hole in the limb there, uh, underlying, uh, overlying a fracture, the muscle flap raised to, to fill that defect. Skin graft again put on the top, and here's another example of that. And then this type of thing, this was from South Sudan towards the end of last year. Uh, it's a 67 year old lady who had a gunshot wound to the back of the head. And here you can see granulation tissue, exposed skull and exposed brain. And, this is the type of thing we think, oh, what on earth can we do around, around this? And, and this, this was done in a relatively, this procedure was a relatively basic hospital, no fancy equipment required, but this is where, as I say, moving beyond life and limb and, and thinking more about function and form and what do we do with that? This was either destined to have dressings for months and months and probably never heal and end up with, you know, getting an infected, uh, uh, you know, an infection, epilepsy, and and, um, and and quite possibly just coming, but with a relatively simple te technique, particularly for a plastic surgeon, those amongst you who are plastic surgeons, you know, there's a big scalp flap raised, the wound debrided, scalp flap, trans defect, skin graft put on immediately. This is a result a few days later. Um, and this is a lady who was discharged one week after surgery. So this is, you know, simple technology and techniques that, that can reduce the amount of suffering uh, hugely. So that's reconstructive war surgery, um, comprehensive integrated approach. This is what I've done with Interburn for many, many years and it's been uh, published now um, based on all our work. Uh, trying to improve quality and capacity building and learn middle income countries for burn care. And the process is around defining standards, the, assessing the assets and the needs, the gap analysis, implementing action, and then assessing impact. So these standards was the first step, and this was uh, a process done through a, 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 a Delphi type process at a meeting held in Nepal, 2012-13, with 30 participants to set standards for burn care services and low and middle income countries for both uh, for, for basic, intermediate and advanced level care. And then to develop an evaluation process that goes alongside this, looking at capacity, what are the resources, delivery, what is done, and outcome, what are the results? And then there's gap analysis is done, tailored program designed, and then monitoring the valuation. So this is the sort of the, the, the integrated approach, if you like. So here's an example of a, a scorecard, and this has also been published recently as the delivery assessment tool, which is now done in many countries around the globe. It's, it's done in, uh, independently in, in, uh, in Palestine. It's been taken up by the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia. It's been done using our app and our, our facilitation guide without any formal face-to-face -face teaching in, in, um, in Nigeria, in Mongolia, and in Papua New Guinea. And this takes 10 areas of, of uh, burn care and scores them all, and you end up with a, a scorecard. And the way the scoring works is quite complicated, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but if you look at something like surgery, you have a total score of 10, and you know, you have out of two for emergency surgery, early excision and grafting, burn reconstruction, surgical capital, so-called capital. So if you take something like 
excision and grafting, well, if, if you do none, then that's zero. If you're not doing it, but steps are in place to address this, you score a half. If you're delivering it to a limited degree, one. If you're delivering it to some patients, two. To the majority, three. And to all four. So you can see it's very kind of granular, and you end up with a, a total score out of 100. And that will deliver a, a score sheet like this, which gives you the the, the 10 areas, policies and procedures, activities, burn care team, surgery, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the right here, you see this then highlights what the gaps are and the areas that are emphasized in blue are what the team themselves decide are the priority areas and what they need to do. So this is this has proven to be a very effective system using the standards, participatory self-evaluation, gap analysis, QI scorecard, prioritize actions, implement, and this then requires an integrated education and training portfolio, which again, we've developed, as I say, entirely from, from scratch, which includes community burn care and prevention, basic burn care, essential, advanced, comprehensive burn care training retreats, training centers, online support, faculty training, but also a non-clinical program, which includes things such as the QI, online implementation improvement course, academic writing workshop, et cetera. And we know with this approach, we, we did a, a study looking in, um, at uh, services uh, in Nepal and Bangladesh, where we implemented this approach. And here you can see, this is the score of all, all the services um, between 2016 and 2019. You can see there's an upward trend in all of them. So this, this provides sort of good evidence to say that this approach does actually work. And then uh, just moving quickly on to emergency assistance, another sort of area. So this this is uh, um, this is uh, this was Gaza um, back in 2018 when uh, it was a combination of the American embassy moving to Jerusalem plus the the uh, anniversary of uh, of what was is called the Nakba, the catastrophe. Um, and this build-up of these great march of return. So all these things kind of came together and exploded on, on May the 14th uh, in, in Gaza. And here, just this is the main hospital. So this is quite early in the morning. You see, you know, there's not too much to brag there. There's two ambulances, another, another ambulance. And the security here, they shut the gate in between. This is a triage sort of area in here, and uh, um, I say it's quite relatively to be on. Just here, another ambulance coming in. Put in the signs coming back to the left, and you see that the gate is kept open in a second. Let the next ambulance in, and down here. Whilst this doesn't seem like a huge amount, you know, this, 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 you know, this is a 40 second video clip for 44 ambulances. This went home, home all day, and then uh, you can see the type of patients that coming in here. And these were almost entirely different men. I lost the judgment um, coming in one after the other after the other. Um, so statistically, there was approximately two thousand seven hundred and seventy people injured, including two hundred and fifty-five children that day. One thousand seven hundred and sixty hospitalised. 1,366 wounded by live ammunition and 63 uh, dead, including eight children. So when you look at that, the, where, where I was working in Shifa, we had 170 patients between two o'clock and, and 10 o'clock with gunshot wounds. That's 21 per hour or one every three minutes for eight hours continuously with high velocity uh, uh, gunshot injuries with extensive uh, bony soft tissue uh, injury. And these are, you know, some of those injuries that came in one after the other, after the other continuously. Um, I'm not actually going to go into this because we're, we're sort of running out of time um, around the clinical management. That's fairly, fairly evident. You can see how crowded and, and busy it was there um, around the principles, clearly of, of, of assessment, the immediate management, uh, management of the vascular injury, the management of the bony. Uh, injury uh, and the management of the soft tissue injuries um, and what's actually done and neurological injuries. So just sort of the, the key learning points I think is more important, which is even in chaos, stay calm. You need to keep it simple and keep it safe. Think of the many, but also the few. 
to bride rapidly and thoroughly. Don't be tempted to close wounds, which is something which we still don't seem to have learned. Follow basic principles. Write a concise and clear operation note. Work within your capacity. Be efficient, but still maintain dignity and clinical accuracy. And understand the frustration and anger and accept that not everything will always go as planned. And I think those were some of the key learning points from that. And then finally, versatility and humanitarian action. This is just to show you how sometimes you need a very broad skill set to do humanitarian surgical work. So this is from U Ukraine, where I was for the last, uh, well, came back a couple of weeks ago. I was there for five weeks. Um, and just the different types of things in that relatively short time that you have to do. So this was involved, you know, asset and needs assessment. So looking at uh, hospital facilities, surgical facilities, what they've got, what their needs are, what they might be in the future, what the priorities are, et cetera. And then working with logistics to, to try and um, support those needs, you know, down to security and protection. You know, we spent, we shifted seven tons of sandbags to, to protect the, uh, the ICRC building from blast, et cetera. You know, quite hard physical labor. Uh, to actually logistics and supply and delivering equipment. Um, this was delivering um, the um, plastic sheeting and uh, uh, blast proof um, film for windows to one of the hospitals. Weapon contamination, um, you know, this was in, uh, I think, Irpin or Bucha, I'm not sure now. And, and, you know, taping up areas you may not see there, but here you can see there's uh, quite a large shell of unexploded ordnance, which clearly can be quite dangerous. So marking out that when you come across it. Protection issues, uh, you know, mass graves. Uh, this, this was a tank emplacement. Um, this is a school. <laughs> Um, and uh, and also doing uh, medical examinations of POWs, etc., and then actual clinical care. So this was in uh, in a scene in Erpin, I think, where you know there was just still some people in the street uh, who who were suffering from problems and very vulnerable people left uh, in in bombed out buildings, etc., uh, who needed healthcare. Down to you know driving uh, driving supplies, driving convoys, supporting. Uh, you know, and, and doing that type of work. So very, very mixed bag of, of, of activities, um, sometimes involved in the broader sense in humanitarian surgery. And then to finish the future, I think, uh, you know, global inequality to global equity is, is what we need to work towards. Um, and that's clearly a very big ask, but that's what we need to, to look at. I think we need to perhaps try and get away from the more corporate to the more community led and community delivered. And certainly with things like burn prevention, again, I haven't mentioned there, we've done a lot of work on that and community participation is the answer to that. And whilst we're moving to a more and more connected world, et cetera, I think we mustn't forget that, you know, humanity is very much community based. I think we do need to think about being cleaner and greener. Um, otherwise, we're going to suffer the consequences. And I think perhaps sometimes we, we need to not overemphasize technological solutions, um, but really understand that most things require behavioral solutions. It's, a, you know, whatever technology you have, you still have a human being at the end of it. And you need to be able to, as I say, knowledge, et cetera, and technology without behavior change uh, don't have such an impact. And we need to put health before wealth. Um, so all these things, violence, war, terrorism, political unrest, you know, life expectancy, homelessness, all these are really are a result of global inequality. So that's the biggest issue behind uh, and that, that we need to address in terms of improving healthcare across the, the globe and uh, including surgical. So that's, uh, and, and just my last slide is just these, for any of you interested, these are a few books that I think are, are really useful and, and helpful and, and have influenced me uh, to an extent in some of the ways I think. And as you can see, most of them are nothing to do with, with surgery at all. One is Poor Economics, A Radical Rethinking of the Way to Fight Global Poverty, which is, which is a very, very interesting book. Um, and The Spirit Level uh, is another book that, again, this kind of looks at equality across the globe and how that impacts on, on all sorts of uh, uh, um, indicators of social unrest, etc. Knowledge Translation in Healthcare, 
very very good book that that sort of there's a real guide to looking at uh, um, how we move from knowledge to action, and then three completely unconnected at all with anything to do with health on identity by Amin Malouf, which is a, a very interesting look at what we understand by identity and ourselves. And a little bit similar, L'Espèce Fabulatrice, sorry, it's in French, that one. <laughs> Very interesting book. I'm not sure if it's available in English. Um, and Gandhi's My Experiments with Truth, which I think was a very uh, interesting um, book as well. So that's my journey through. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've run slightly over time. Um, and uh, thank you very much for listening. And I hope that's been uh, uh, of some interest to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Podekar, uh, for a very personal, comprehensive, and pragmatic look at uh, humanitarian surgical care. I really appreciate, again, appreciate your time. Uh, with the last few minutes, are anyone that has any questions they'd like to ask Dr. Podekar? Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for coming to speak with us. You mentioned impact and outcome research, which in a, the context of humanitarian surgery is hindered by the lack of trauma registries or shared data um, repositories. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit to your thoughts about um, possible opportunities for data collection, standardization and data collection and sharing among humanitarian surgical actors? Yeah, thanks. So uh, yes, data, I mean, data is clearly important um, because without data, you, you, you need data to provide evidence of, of uh, to, to be able to access resources, to provide evidence to politicians and to provide evidence as to what is needed in terms of change and what direction to go in and to know if what you are doing is successful or not. So data is clearly very important. I, I think there's data exists at different levels. And uh, I think, again, there's, there's, it is important to have global data that you're able to is standardized and you can, you can then um, look at uh, different places across the globe and see how they perform, if you like, uh, uh, with respect to each other. But I also think that when it comes to actually influencing and impacting change, as I say, it comes down then to the actual service delivery at the coalface, if you like. So you can collect data on, you know, the global burn registry, for example, is a good example. And it's a very good data set because it's easy to put in and even I can do it and I'm hopeless on computers. Um, but at the end of the day, what, you know, it, that's useful for looking at overall global trends and for driving policy change, but it probably won't impact quite as much where the data is actually collected unless people are using it on a regular basis to look at their service and what can be improved in it. So I think there's different levels. You need sort of metadata, if you like, for looking at global change and, and, and I say, driving policy and strategy but you also need locally held, locally produced, um, locally owned data that is used on a very practical day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis to, to, to drive quality improvement as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Wild. Any other questions? Dr. Mark? Tom, good to see you again after, what, about 10 years? <laughs> uh, Tom and I did a lot together at the WHO when I was there in the late 2000s. Um, really did great work promoting burns, a very, uh, I mean, Tom did, a uh, you know, very neglected uh, topic. So uh, great to see you moving along on all these great, I mean, important things. But one question, um, in a place like Ukraine, where there's so much devastation and, you know, so many hospitals, where the locals, local surgeons are providing, you know, most of the care. How does ICRC, I saw you, you know, show like I think three or four different towns uh, where, you, where the ICRC was working. How do you pick among all those? Um, and how do you sort of maximize the influence of, you know, what a few outsiders can do, um, in a, you know, with so much need? Yeah, thanks Charlie and, and good to see you again. Um, it's, I mean, it's interesting uh, in, in Ukraine, I, I think to an extent, the rest of the world and the humanitarian sector as well um, were very much 
behind compared to Ukraine in, in preparing for this. Um, it was interesting. I was there quite soon after it started, a week or so. And uh, actually, most people I spoke to within Ukraine, within the health sector as well, you know, knew that this was coming at some point. They didn't know specifically the date, but, you know, they knew it was coming and were actually quite well prepared. And I think it's important that we, it, there's a tendency whenever there's a disaster or or, or um, catastrophe somewhere that we just kind of habitually, our brain tends to think of it automatically almost as a low resource environment. Of course, Ukraine isn't, you know, Ukraine was a, you know, a highly functioning, very, very sort of modern resource with a, with a very extensive healthcare system. So in actual fact, um, the, on the ground, this scenario, because we constantly get asked about, you know, uh, people saying, oh, can we come and help? And do you need surgeons and blah, blah. The reality is currently, currently, there's not a huge need, for example, for clinical staff to be there. They have enough staff, they have the expertise, they have the skills, and they're currently not overwhelmed horrible it is but just in terms of crude numbers across the whole country when you average it out you know they're they're not currently overwhelmed and unable to cope but again this does also relate to the fact that you know there's areas where people can't get to including icrc uh, where the needs are probably higher and, and there are there are um, more needs in terms of access and how we sort of choose as an organization well icrc as as you know is the sort of uh, the holder of international humanitarian law we have a you know we have a different role from other ngos whether that's msf or emergency or any other organization which puts us in a unique position and, and our mandate if you like is to work on you know across different sides and some of you may have seen that the, the sort of social media outcry and abuse we got uh, at one point in ukraine because the president had uh, had visited um russia as well which um you know, there was a lot of mistruths uh, spread about that. And actually, he'd come to, to, to Ukraine first. And, you know, because we are neutral and impartial um, and independent, we work on both sides. So clearly, we have to see both sides. In terms of getting to some of these places, uh, there, there's, a, there's an ongoing debate to an extent around security and, and what level of security risk uh, we're able to accept and I think there's some changes in that which I would see for the positive which, which kind of means that we need to push a bit harder I think rather than uh, um, you know stepping back um, and it, of course everything then has to be negotiated as to whether you can go somewhere or not uh, as well so you know we we in terms of the needs you know some of the the in for example somewhere like Erpin there was there was a lot of uh or not a lot though from a city of 60,000 or something I can't remember how many that there was only you know a few thousand people left living there who were clearly the most vulnerable who either didn't want to or unable to leave um and they have some primary health care needs you know not surgical certainly um, and what was needed there was was making the place safe because there's so much unexploded ordnance around and resupplying things like water. And I'm pleased to say just a few days ago, um, we managed to get the water supply back into to Erpin. So a lot of what have type stuff to do. Um, clearly, there's a lot of protection issues. Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, we, we have team working across not just in health but health protection and you know mental health as well but um and i say what have and economic security providing uh, funding for people uh, to get the essentials etc uh so it's it's a uh, it, it and obviously there's just like in any situation like this there are these coordination meetings that you know that uh, where where msf and who and everyone you know speaks together in a central hub to try and identify where the needs are etc so i'm not sure if that's entirely answered your question but uh, hopefully in part <laughs> thanks again dr Porter. again we appreciate your time uh, we know how precious uh, it is and thanks all who joined uh, for our first joint global health and department of surgery grand rounds and uh, look forward to next year's opportunity. And uh, thanks again, Dr. Kodakar. Thanks very much. And I hope you all have a, a good uh, rest of the day there. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Kodakar, again, on behalf of the Department of Global Health. That was absolutely amazing and fantastic talk. Thanks, Jason. Bye-bye.